Hey there, and welcome to part two of Burner, episode 51 of Cyberpunk Librarian. Before we get into the show, you might want to go back and check out part one if you haven't done that. Because what we're talking about here today is a laptop you can ditch if you need to. Like a burner phone, you can have a burner laptop. In part one, we cover the hardware, and here in part two, we're going to talk about software. You could have one without the other, I suppose, but the reason this episode was broken into two parts is simply because there was so much to talk about. So yeah, dig on the first part if you can, but for right now, I hope you enjoy part two. And hey, before we dive in, I need to correct something I said on the previous episode, something pointed out to me by Jason Griffey and John Fink on Twitter. While talking about GPS, I said that GPS needs to be a two-way communication to work, which is why you're looking to avoid it as you can reveal your location not only to you, but to others. Thing is, GPS is actually a one-way thing. Your GPS works by reception only and does not transmit. However, your GPS can work with a whole myriad of apps that can transmit your location. Take Twitter, for instance, for a simple example. You can geotag a tweet, and that's just a simple thing to do. With all of the apps that can talk to your GPS and relaying location information out to the network, that is why you want to be careful about GPS, especially because it's not always obvious which app is using it or even if an app is using it. That was the message I was trying to get across, but I did a piss-poor job of doing it. So big thanks to Jason and John for pointing this out. You can see the correction in the show notes for that episode, too. So, sorry about that, audience. I do apologize. So, okay now. Let's do this. Let's face it, most of the stuff we do today gets done in a web browser. So let's start there. First and foremost, we need to talk about which web browser to use, and the answer to that, my friends, is Firefox. Now I can hear the Chrome and Chromium fans sharpening their axes and getting their pitchforks nice and pointy, but just hear me out here. Chrome, and to a certain degree Chromium, both send information back to Google. Indeed, since Chrome is Google's browser, you can bet it's gathering all kinds of information about what you're doing, what pages you visited, what you're searching for, and just generally slurping up all of that delicious data so they can better serve you an ad for Razer brand keyboards and cheese or something or other. God knows. That's fine when you don't care, but my lovelies, if you're using a burner device, You're supposed to be keeping things on the down low. You're kind of supposed to care about that stuff. Now, Firefox doesn't track you, at least not in the same way that Chrome does. Now, to be sure, Firefox does gather data and send it back to Mozilla, but all of this data is anonymized, and you can choose not to share it if you like. So, Firefox is also completely open source. When it comes to privacy use Firefox, because while Chrome is a very nice browser, it's not completely open source, and while Chromium is also a nice browser and is completely open source, there are parts of it that can send information back to Google and other places. It all depends on what extensions you might be using and things like that. So if you're a Chrome fan, that's fine. Save Chrome for your normal computer, okay? And if you already use Firefox as your default browser, well, thank you. I use it every day and only launch Chrome on the rare occasions that I need a certain extension or two. There are some good extensions in Chrome, don't get me wrong, I do like Chrome, I just don't like it as much as I do Firefox. Another thing is to make sure your browser isn't remembering things for you, because all browsers do this. Having a record of your browsing history is great on your normal computer. Not so much for the burner. You can do a couple of things, but one of the easiest ways to get around this is to simply use Firefox's incognito mode. That way the browsing history isn't retained at all, 
And, you know, that way you have that extra measure of security. Keep in mind, just because you're using incognito mode doesn't mean that people can't snoop in on your traffic. That's why you set up that aforementioned VPN first, remember? And then you launch Firefox. The second thing you can do is open up the preferences and uh, hit that privacy tab, and then set your browser history to never remember. Or better yet, just be safe and do both. Next thing, you're going to want a few extensions. Now, you don't need a lot, and what you'll want might vary according to your own tastes. At the very least, I suggest that you get an ad blocker and some kind of anti-tracking extension. Everything about online ads seems to get more and more horrible every month, and they've gone from being a nuisance to tracking you across the web to injecting malware into your browser and operating system. You can be selective about which sites you want to block ads from on your normal computer, but on your burner, block everything. For that, I use uBlock Origin. It's easier on the memory and the CPU than the classic AdBlock Plus, and when you're running your burner on a netbook, that kind of thing matters. For anti-tracking, I recommend Privacy Badger from the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Not only does it block tracking attempts, it too is an ad blocker. Then again, if you think about it, it's gotten to the point that you know, ads are what's tracking you anyway. But Privacy Badger will also stop other tracking techniques that um, you block origin doesn't. It's very much a case of having the right tool for the right job, as both of these extensions complement and enhance each other. I also recommend HTTPS Everywhere because, like it says, it enables secure HTTP web connections on sites that are known to support it, even if they don't normally default to it. So even if a given site doesn't normally send you to the encrypted HTTP connection on its own, this little extension will insist that it does. And of course, check the show notes at cyberpunklibrarian.com slash podcast, and you'll find links to all of these things. Now, an honorable mention goes out to NoScript Security Suite. This thing is a monster when it comes to shutting down unnecessary JavaScript and the like. Beyond that, it'll protect you against things like clickjacking, script injection, and cross-site scripting attacks. It can be a bit of a job to get it configured the way you like, but I think it's worth the trouble. Okay, the browser is pretty much set. What do you want to do with it now? Fire up Google and get to searching. Wrong. No, no. Do not go to Google for your searching. We are trying to keep things on the down low, remember? You want to search. Search using a search engine that cares about your privacy and isn't tracking what you're searching for. So to that end, DuckDuckGo is your jam. Personally, I love DDG, and you can see how it's improved over the years to become a great search engine. I mean, yeah, back in the day, it was, it was kind of touch and go there. These days, I would give it the Pepsi challenge against Google. I think it's pretty good. Better yet, it doesn't keep following you across the web. It doesn't track what you're searching to sell you things, and it behaves like a good citizen. And you know something else that's cool? You can totally theme DuckDuckGo to give it a look that you like. And you know why that's good? Because Google always looks the same. I don't know about you, but I can look at a screen from across the room and see that someone is using Google. Google looks like Google. Bing kind of looks like Google, but you can tell it's not. Google looks like Google because Google has a distinctive look. And while DuckDuckGo also has a distinctive look... You can customize that a bit, and it's not 100% obvious what you're doing after you do some customization. Do you want a dark mode? You can do that. Do you need high contrast? Well, sure, you can do that too. Do you want to just roll your own theme? Do it. You can make DDG your own, and then you can save your settings to the cloud, and it'll stay that way if you like. But, but wait, how? How? Well, DuckDuckGo will ask you for a passphrase to remember your settings. It will even suggest one if you like. That passphrase isn't tied to a username, because it doesn't ask for a username. When you go back to DuckDuckGo, you can enter that passphrase and poof, your settings are back. Even cooler, 
DDG offers a thing they call bangs. And we're talking about bang as in the other word for exclamation points. By using an exclamation mark and a key letter or two, you can use DDG to anonymously search other websites. So if you start your search with bang A or exclamation point A, you'll wind up searching Amazon. Bang W gets you Wikipedia and Bang YT will get you YouTube. You'll wind up on those sites when your search is executed. Now, don't worry too much about learning all of these little shortcuts. You should just pick up the ones that you think you would have, you know, the ones that you would find most useful. Because as of this recording, DuckDuckGo currently has over 9,000 of them. I mean, if you want to learn them all, don't let me stop you, but I'm not going to encourage it. Finally, let's talk about going deep into the dark web. When you want to get even more anonymous online than you already have, then it's time to reach for Tor. Tor, that's T-O-R, is short for the onion router. It's a protocol and a method of sending information across the web by bouncing it through servers all over the world. Say you want to hit the library's website and look for a book. Normally, you'd type the URL into your browser, and it'll pretty much take the shortest path it can find to get there thanks to DNS lookup. You might make 10 to 20 hops from your router to your ISP to a router at the ISP and another router and eventually to a router at the library and then into the library's web server. That's a simplification, but the point is, is that your request will take the shortest route it can to get from your computer to the server you're after. Tor, on the other hand, will bounce that request through servers all over the world before dropping it into the library's web server all the while anonymizing your location, your IP, and information about your computer. Anyone trying to follow that trail will have a hell of a job trying to figure out where that request originated. Now, I can hear you thinking, won't all that hopping about slow down my connection? Yes, totally. Tor is not fast, and probably never will be. However, you are trading speed for security and anonymity, and sometimes that's a good trade. Beyond that, there are websites on the dark web that are totally inaccessible without Tor. These sites have URLs that don't look anything like what you're used to. Most of them are seemingly random collections of letters and numbers, because they kind of are random collections of letters and numbers. Unlike normal URLs, which end with a .com or a .net or a .ninja, which I think is actually a thing, or a .org, you know, whatever, a Tor site ends with Dot onion. For instance, DuckDuckGo has its own Tor site, so you can not only search anonymously, but you can search anonymously on a network that's making you even more anonymous. That URL is, <laughs> I'm going to try this, http colon slash slash 3 g 2 upl 4 pq 6 kufc 4 monion Yeah, um, there's, there's, there's a link out there. You can, you can find this pretty easily. It's, it's easier to do that than to try and write that down. Now, some sites are there on tour for political resistance, and some are totally passe, like the DuckDuckGo search engine. It's just there as another, even more anonymous way to search for things. And yes, other sites are downright criminal. The media is well known for sensationalizing anything it can get its hands on. So, I won't candy coat this, but I am not going to drag Tor through the mud because the media tends to have a field day doing that on their own. So, there are things on Tor that can be scary. I mean, some of you have probably heard of the Silk Road, which was a place to buy drugs and all kinds of services that were criminal in nature. And you do this using Bitcoin, a you know equally anonymous source of moving money around. So... Yes, there are things like that on tour that can be scary. Just like there are places in downtown wherever you live that you probably wouldn't wander around after dark. The good news is, is you don't have to go to any of those places, both downtown and on tour. Every now and then you will, you know, some website or television station will run this story about the scary stuff and what you'll find on the so-called dark web. And I swear that the only aim of this story is to keep people away from it. You can browse tour all of your life and never run across a site selling guns and drugs because if you're not looking to go there, you're probably not going to end up there. You don't wander down the street and accidentally fall through the door of a crack house. 
And you don't wander around the dark web and accidentally fall into whatever passes for the Silk Road these days. Check the show notes for an article about getting started with Tor and how it works, but for now, let's get this thing up and running. Now, the good news is, is that's about as easy as downloading a file, because the Tor browser is there for you and your underweb needs. Hit the link in the show notes at cyberpunklibrarian.com slash podcast to get to the Tor browser website and download the software to your computer. Now, this software is fully open source and completely cross-platform. So this works on Windows, Mac, and Linux, and I'm certain that there are also Tor browsers for iOS and Android. I know because I've used them, I just don't use them often enough to remember their names. The great thing about Tor Browser is that it will help anonymize your web traffic, and that it's very easy to set up. Tor Browser is specifically a version of Firefox that already includes the NoScript and HTTPS Everywhere extensions. Additionally, Tor Browser comes with a sort of go-between program that connects you to the Tor network before launching the browser part. And it does all of this with one file that needs no installation. You can just double-click and go. As I said, the Tor Browser can be slow, but you trade that speed for security, and there are times that the trade is worth it. Okay, moving on to the final part of setting up a burner laptop. Let's talk about the ultimate in burner security a method of using your laptop where, afterwards, the things that you did don't seem to have ever been there. And that's because they weren't. Because that's precisely how Tails works. Tails is short for the Amnesiac Incognito Live System. It's an operating system absolutely designed from the ground up to anonymize your identity and to preserve your online privacy. Now, like the operating system already on the burner laptop, Tails is based upon Linux. Unlike that operating system, Tails doesn't actually run off of your laptop's hard drive. It runs off of a USB flash drive. Those who've installed Ubuntu flavors before are probably aware that you can set up a USB flash drive that not only boots the computer into Ubuntu setup, but also allows you to just use Ubuntu on that flash drive. It's a live system. So you can run programs, save files, and all of that. But then when you shut down the computer and pull that drive out and then reboot, well, it's back on the computer's normal operating system, and nothing has happened that really shows you were there using Linux. That's precisely how Tails works, except Tails takes extra precautions to leave no trace of its existence or use on the computer. See, you can use an Ubuntu flash drive to do things to the host computer. I've used one a couple of times to fix Windows issues because a friend forgot their password or something. Tails doesn't really allow you to do that. It works hard to make sure that you don't have the ability to operate the computer's physical drives. There's a thing in many operating systems called swap space that functions kind of like RAM, but it's on the disk. So rather than loading a whole bunch of data into memory, an OS might shuffle it into the swap space. And while swap isn't quite as fast as RAM, you can easily have more swap space than RAM capacity because chances are you have more storage than RAM. Tails swap space only uses the memory, and that memory is automatically erased on shutdown and reboot. So your computer doesn't even remember that Tails was there, and because Tails is taking great pains not to touch the computer's physical hard drives, that also leaves no trace that Tails was used. And that's the amnesiac part of the system. Additionally, Tails comes ready to use with a whole suite of software that will enhance your privacy experience. So, it comes ready to use with the Tor browser. It's also got the ability to encrypt space on your flash drive via LUX, the standard in Linux disk encryption. It's got the ability to send email with OpenPGP, 
And it's got instant messaging with OTR, a cryptographic tool that further anonymizes your network traffic. And that's the incognito part of the system. Tails is typically used by people who need to stay underground and off the grid as much as possible. You'll hear stories of how Edward Snowden uses Tails, as does Glenn Greenwald, Laura Poitras, and Micah Lee, to name a few. If you've never downloaded or been to the Tails site before, I suggest you make your first visit using your burner on a VPN and on a public Wi-Fi network to anonymize yourself as much as possible. Because simply visiting the site and downloading the software could get you put on some kind of watch list. There's a link in the show notes to an article about that little fact of life in the land of the free and the home of the brave. Then again, I wouldn't worry all about it that much because the very fact that many of us use Linux could get us put on some kind of list anyway. I just wanted to bring it up as a thing you should be aware of. Either way, you'll find a link to the Tails site in the show notes as well. So, you can set up Tails on a flash drive from any base desktop operating system. So, no matter if you're using Mac OS, Linux, or Windows, you can get Tails on a flash drive. Now, Mac OS is a little sketchy sometimes, so I'm going to talk about how to use Linux because it's the easiest way to do it. And I'll just quickly walk you through it. You're going to want to visit their website because they've got the full list of instructions. But here's kind of the quick rundown. You're going to need a flash drive with at least 4 gigs of space. All data is going to be lost on this drive because Tails takes the entire thing over and makes it a bootable drive. So if you've got anything important on it, transfer it off. About an hour and a half of your time will be required, but most of that is actually just spent downloading Tails because it's a 1.2 gigabyte download. And, you know, that's that's of this, the, the time I'm recording this show. If you're listening to this into the future, Tails might have grown or shrunk depending on needs. And you're going to need a smartphone or another computer or a printer to help you follow some of the instructions as you go along. When you download the Tails ISO image, I suggest using Firefox. The Tails site will help you install a Firefox extension that downloads and verifies the file for integrity and security. After you're done, you can remove this extension if you like. Or you can use their BitTorrent downloader, which is likely even faster. If you're using Ubuntu or Debian, then you can download and install the Tails installer. There are easy instructions on the Tails website, you know, for how to get the appropriate repository added to your software resources and get the file. Don't worry, if you've ever added a PPA to your repository list, you can do this. And if you haven't, the instructions make it pretty easy to do so. After you install the Tails installer software, you'll plug in your USB flash drive and launch the installer. You'll choose that Tails ISO image that you downloaded, select the USB stick, and then click Install Tails. After that's done, and be aware that the progress bar will seem to freeze a few times during installation, that's normal. But after, uh, after that's done, you'll need that smartphone or computer to finish the installation. It's not really required for anything like a two-factor authentication. It's just so you can follow the instructions while it's doing this. Because you're going to need to reboot your computer using the flash drive and Tails. Be aware that you might need to launch a boot menu or something like that when you reboot on the USB drive. Or you might need to set a boot order in your computer's BIOS to allow the boot from USB drive before trying the, you know, before it tries to boot from the internal hard drive. These things can be a little fiddly and it depends on the model. But even with my old netbook, I was able to bring up a boot menu as it comes up and say, no, 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 I want you to boot from the USB drive this time. And it happily does. When you reboot your computer and it, bre and it boots from this flash drive, you'll see a screen that asks you if you want Tails or Tails in troubleshooting mode. Just select Tails. You're not troubleshooting anything. We're just getting started. And in a few more seconds, you'll see the Tails login screen and it'll ask you if you want to see more options. For now, just click No and then click Login. And you're in. Notice it didn't ask for a username. That's because it doesn't want to know who you are. There are options for creating an encrypted persistent storage space on that flash drive if you like, and you can check the Tails website for easy, easy instructions on how to do that. 
And the nice thing about that is, is you can save your files to this part of the little flash drive and it's encrypted. So as soon as you shut down and pull that out, that's encrypted data. It's harder to get to. How you mark your tails drive is up to you. You might not want to mark it at all and simply remember that the red flash drive is the tails drive or whatever. But make sure you remember where it is, what it looks like, and make it a part of your burner's kit. Because, after all, while you may not need tails all the time, you'll definitely want it close by for those times when you do need it. Now, there's a lot more you can do when it comes to setting up your own burner laptop, but I figure these basic steps in the last couple of episodes and configurations will give you a good start. I mean, if you look around the net, you're going to find some other ideas and some things that may or may not work for you there. I just kind of wanted to give you the overview and put the idea in your head that this might be something that you want. And the end, you'll want to make sure that you don't do anything on the burner that you'd want people to get their hands on or allow a program to do that for you. So, for instance, don't install Dropbox. Also, don't leave a persistent Thunderbird email account on there. The less you have on the drive, the better. So if you can do something through a web browser that's in incognito mode, that's far better than installing a program. In other words, check your Gmail through the Gmail website in incognito mode and don't bother installing Thunderbird at all. Because even the existence of a program means that you might have been using it. Sure, I know, this all sounds paranoid. And I assure you, I am not an overly paranoid person. But when it comes to online privacy, a burner device is a step above what most people are doing or might ever do. When you take it up to that next step, you introduce a certain level of paranoia because it helps you keep your data and yourself safe. So stay safe out there, dear hearts. And with that, we come to the end of part two of episode 51 and the end of episode 51 itself. I thank you so much for tuning in and I hope you got some ideas for some kind of burner device or burner laptop that might be of use to you. And hey, if it's not of any use to you at all, at least you kind of know that these things exist. So if someone talks about it, you may be able to have an intelligent conversation or, you know, what the heck ever. After all, knowledge is power. And I hope I gave you just a little bit more power with these last two episodes. The song you're currently digging on is Viscous by Frail. Earlier in the show, you heard... Northern Lights by Alien, and Untitled One, anonymous version by Pollux. As always, the opening track is Belly Dance at Abisu by Ryum Yashita, and you can find links to all of that music in the show notes at cyberpunklibrarian.com slash podcast. Just look for this episode. It's pretty easy to find. I try and make these things pretty easily discoverable. Cyberpunk Librarian is hosted by the Internet Archive at archive.org, and I thank them so much for everything they do. Those are some great people doing even greater things here recently over at the Internet Archive. They are looking to create a backup of the entire archive and host it on Canadian servers, and I believe they're still taking donations as of this show. So if you're looking for something to make a little charitable donation to here as we come to the, uh, come to the end of tax season, well, you know... That might be a good place to throw some money at because it would be going to a fantastic cause. And hey, big shout outs to the Electronic Frontier Foundation at EFF.org. They also are doing some great things, including making the Privacy Badger extension for Firefox that I talked about earlier in the show. If you're looking for another place to make a few donations here in the next uh, few weeks as we draw near tax time, well, that might be a good place to go too. If you'd like to get in touch with me, well, I would love to hear from you. And by God, I have a lot of ways to make that happen. Just in case you might have forgotten, this show is also hosted on YouTube at youtube.com slash cyberpunk librarian. I try and get that up about the same time as the show goes live on the quote unquote traditional medium of RSS and iTunes. So there might be a couple, you know, a couple minutes lag there, but you know. 
I try and get that up as quickly as possible. You can always drop a comment there or in the show notes at cyberpunklibrarian.com slash podcast. You can find the Cyberpunk Librarian community in a couple of places. My personal favorite is on MZ. That's imzy.com slash cyberpunklibrarian. You'll find this show posted there along with some links throughout the week and interesting things that pop up in my, you know, in my RSS feeds that I think you might enjoy. I also do the same thing at facebook.com slash cyberpunk librarian. You will find most of that content to be fairly well duplicated. So, you know, pick your social network and do the thing that feels right to you. If you want to reach out to me on Twitter, I am at librarian. That's B-I-B-R-A-R-I-A. And it's like librarian, but it starts with a B. You can find me on the Google Plus as well, as long as it's still around. I am google.com slash plus Daniel Messer. And, you know, if you really want to use that good old-fashioned tried-and-true method of sending an email, well, you can hit me at cyberpunklibrarian at protonmail.com. I would love to hear from you if you've got questions, ideas from a show, just want to rant and rave, or you want to point out that I totally flubbed something in the last episode. I would love to hear that because, you know, I can be wrong. I have been wrong on the internet. Sometimes that person who is wrong on the internet is me. And... You know, there's nothing worse than having the wrong information out there. So if you hear something, you know, you might want to comment on, hey, drop me a line. I would love to hear from you. But for now, I think it's time to get out of here. I wish you a wonderful day. No matter what time you're listening to this, there's always 24 hours to go. So, hey, thank you so much. And remember, you don't have to be high tech to be low budget, but it certainly helps if you're a cyberpunk. Take care out there. Thank you.